Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, I have uh, guests, Taylor Moritz and Tim Snowball. And um, what we're going to do is start off the show telling you a little bit about how we got in the liberty movement, and a little bit about what we're doing for a living right now. But first, um, you're going to want to watch this show regularly and over and over again, and there are many ways to do that. When the shows run live, uh, approximately two weeks after the show, you can see it on YouTube, and of course send links to all of your friends, neighbors, and relatives, so nine or ten people will get to watch the show. <laughs> and if you want to watch it on Access Sacramento, you can watch it at eight o'clock on Thursday on Channel 17 in the Sacramento area, uh, noon on Friday, or my favorite time, 4 a.m. on Saturday. Now, about me. Uh, my name is again John Cameron. I now work, um, I think my formal title is um, Liberty to Society Manager, which means I'm a fundraiser for Pacific Legal Foundation, and basically we defend the Constitution of the United States against all comers, those comers being governments and government agencies who uh, don't like something like the Constitution getting in their way as they lead us toward the totalitarian state. Now, I became um, libertarian, randite, uh, whatever you want to call it, at a very early age, and uh, carried the passion for liberty throughout my life. When I became a paratrooper, I signed an oath that said that I would defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I have taken that, that oath past my military service to my current job and uh, to the show. So, um, Taylor Moritz, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now, and how you came to the Liberty Movement? Yeah, so now I'm a reporter and writer for the Capital Morning Report, um, but my journey to the Liberty Movement uh, started when I was actually really unsure about what my political identity was. So I was working for a very democratic organization and also a very conservative <coughs> Republican organization. And I started to realize that um, you can I felt somewhere. You mentioned the second one on air, not the first one. You can mention <laughs> the second one. Jarvis. Yes, Howard <laughs> yeah, Jarvis. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I realized that I fell somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. um, obviously a little bit socially liberal and fiscally conservative. So that is how I ended up <laughs> here. I don't understand what happened, but I'm going to check my wallet in just a second. <laughs> All right. And so you are, once again, I, I apologize for the interruption, you are... A uh, reporter and no, writer. I mean, you are, your, your principles are? Libertarian. Libertarian. Yeah. Okay, as long as we got that straight. If not, you're out. No, we've had <laughs> non-libertarians on the show. It, it's very interesting to watch them defend their lack of principle. But uh, <laughs> go ahead, Tim Snowball. Tell us a little about you. where you are now, how you got there. You are a? Yes, I am a soon-to-be hopeful attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation, currently awaiting California bar, bar results. Mm -hmm. uh, Hopes are high. Now you took uh, that test when? Took the California bar exam in July. July, and you get I your only, results? I only, prepped, I only prepped for two months straight. Two months straight, yeah. <laughs> a lot of coffee. Results the coffee are released shops, uh, November 17th. November 17th. So. We, shall, we shall have to buy you a drink <laughs> on the 17th. Yeah. <laughs> I was a um, politically interested kid. I always used to watch the news with my mom and whatnot, and uh, became kind of a history nerd. It was my favorite, favorite class in grade school. Mm. And this is uh, in between being a Star Wars nerd oh, uh, and a don't, No, don't get me started. We can do a whole separate show on Star Wars <laughs> if you want. Oh, God. But <laughs> um, I had been someone who had kind of not been interested in school, didn't really like high school that much, and had gone back to uh, college at a later age and um, had almost immediately been attracted to liberty-based ideas. And I had always kind of assumed um, that those were the ideas that kind of government espoused and government was following, and it, it, it kind of came as a realization. And I had some fantastic professors at the university that I was going Where'd to. Where'd you go to school? Well, I, I did two years at community college, yeah. um, which I don't know if that's considered to be a socialist institution mm -hmm. or not, but uh, <laughs> I benefited from it mm -hmm. um, and did my undergraduate work, uh, finished up at UC Berkeley, which is almost, just almost Russia, but not not quite, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> better weather. I enjoyed I enjoyed being the outspoken yeah. person uh, mm -hmm. there and in law school. Mm -hmm. So and where'd you go to law school? Uh, GW Law, George Washington University okay. in DC. Okay. So and where did you go to school? You went uh, to Sac State. Sac State, mm -hmm. yeah. Sac State. But I also was a community college. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. About five yeah. different ones. Yeah. Two <laughs> dropouts. <laughs> Finally made it to the finish line. <laughs> well, you know, the, the finish line is the important thing. And now we are. We ran a good and race, Tim. Yeah. So, um, 
you managed to hold on your libertarian principles at Berkeley. I say they were intensified, uh, to be quite honest with you. By seeing the stupidity. Well, I was, I was always considered to be kind of a moderate uh, among friends back in San Diego mm -hmm. and uh, got up to Berkeley and, you know, chimed in class a few times and they were like, whoa, whoa, we've got, you know, Rush Limbaugh or Sh uh, Sean Hannity here. And oh, I was okay. like, really? Like, <laughs> I thought that these were pretty uh, basic uh, principles of the Republic, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Well, I think the show's over. We spin a note. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to do, um, learned audience is uh, we're going to have uh, Tim talk a little bit about uh, three cases, um, three cases in different practice areas at Pacific Legal Foundation. We're we your organization is really focusing on the three P's: personal liberty, property rights, and procedural guarantees. And Tim, first, uh, you want to talk about. Clark versus Seattle. Sure, so this is a, a case that I've actually been working on uh, so far quite a bit at PLF. Uh, so with Clark versus Seattle, you basically had the Seattle City Council step in and uh, basically impose unionization on the Uber and Lyft drivers uh, in Seattle. And the basis uh, for the case um, for their legal justification, <laughs> the legal brokers, justification for them doing, doing it, um, or have been a line of cases that previously had applied to public um, union members. Mm and non-union members. And the rationale uh, for that justification, which actually is coming up before the Supreme Court, which actually doesn't have much justification itself. So it's been accepted by the Supreme Court? It has Court? been accepted, yeah, excellent, very, very exciting. Yep. Yeah. I think it's the Janus case. I can't remember okay. the second half of the All case. Right. But basically, uh, this is a First Amendment issue mm -hmm. having to do with forced speech and forced association, yeah. where they are basically stepping in and forcing uh, these drivers to become part of a union, whether they like it or not. And even if they don't join the union, they'll be compelled to pay union dues to support the union. So if I understand that right, then um, this, the city council in Seattle. Seattle has decided that it is their civic duty to force <laughs> Uber and Lyft drivers to join a union. They're doing them a real favor. And, and what was their justification <laughs> for doing this based upon constitutional principles? So you've got the, the case that it's based upon um, that's been in the briefings has been a boot. A boot is the name of the case. And w in a boot, it was a public union they were dealing with. And the two justifications were something called labor peace, which mm. in a public sphere is just facing, well, you have to keep the peace. This is a public institution. This will keep the peace. It's called labor peace. And then you have what's called, I'm sure you've heard of the free rider problem, which mm. is, well, if we allow people to, to have the benefit of union representation because they're part of this industry without paying toward the union, mm. then they're free riding, right? Mm. Both of those justifications are tenuous at best, even as applied to public uh, sector workers, and we are going to argue that they're inapplicable at all in regards to private contractors who I still are. Don't, and, and forgive me. Sure. I should understand this. Maybe I do, and I'm just asking him to explain it a little better. <laughs> uh, not that you haven't done a good job. You've done a wonderful job explaining it. What was their, I mean, forcing people to unionize? What, to protect the public? Was uh, that there? Sure. Well, so what you'll find in a lot of these cases where the government is basically stepping in and asserting their authority is what's mm. called the general welfare, right? Mm. And when it comes to legal issues, um, a lot of times lawyers, especially government lawyers, are masters at language, masters mm. at, at, at manipulating ambiguous language. Mm. And so this term, general welfare, goes all the way back to the early part of you know the FDR era. Mm. And it winds up being a catch-all phrase mm -hmm. for the assertion of government authority. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the main points I think they asserted were, oh, well, we want to make sure that the these drivers are efficient and the mm. prices are low and competitive and all this. And I go, isn't that the entire reason why they've gained <laughs> such a high market share? Is that mm -hmm. they're offering a service to mm -hmm. the public at competitive rates? Yeah. And so uh, this strikes me as a, a problem or it was a solution uh, in search of a problem. They want to do this. And it's oh. the first time in the country uh, that a city or municipality will have imposed this type of regime. Mm. And so it's a very important case. Um, it's pending before the Ninth Circuit now. Okay. So their, um, their justification was the general wel welfare, general welfare <laughs> pointed at the welfare of the drivers or the welfare of the, the public? Pu the public writ large. Okay. And they didn't, they didn't even bother to throw down the usual government nonsense about safety and Licensing to keep a high standard and all the rest of that. It was simply the the general welfare. Safety thing. has been uh, part of the full blown assault on the ride shares. <laughs> I mean, the, it, they've tried to pull every kind of criticism out of the hat to get these like to get Lyft and Uber to 
I don't get it, to become more regulated, they work so much better than taxis. Mm. And uh, this actually reminds me when I was visiting my sister in Portland, we were sitting in a restaurant and there was all these stickers laying around that said, we stand with taxis. And I was like, what is this? And I asked the server, what is this? And she was like, oh, this is a campaign that we're running because Lyfts and Ubers are unsafe. And there's been a lot of people who have been, you know, like murdered or sexually assaulted mm. in Lyfts and Ubers. Um, so we're just trying to raise awareness about that. And, mm. you know, we stand yeah. with the taxis. And I was like, you know that Lyft and Ubers are GPS tracked, right? Mm. And uh, taxis aren't. Mm. So I think there's just a lot of these uh, and arguments. And you know you get to see the face of your, your driver before they show exactly. up. And, and if then, you went yeah. missing, it, yeah. it would be easy to yeah. find, mm -hmm. well, the last person that you were in contact with, mm -hmm. aka your driver. It's akin, <laughs> it's akin to advocating on behalf of covered wagons to mm -hmm. uh, protect them from the advent of the Model T or mm -hmm. something. Yeah, it, I don't get it. It's, it's made so many people's lives better, and mm -hmm. it's way more reliable and dependable. It's just an attack on the private Spontane sector. Spontaneous order is too unpredictable, though. You, mm -hmm. can't, you can't simply have these companies providing goods and services to the public at competitive yeah. prices. Heaven forbid. <laughs> you know, I'd love to see somebody <laughs> run some stats on. Uh, the incidence of uh, DUI arrests in an area before Uber and Lyft, post Uber and Lyft. That's I'm willing to bet that yeah. you could find, because before, taxis are hard to get, mm -hmm. heinously expensive, and people, uh, even though it's a, it's a stupid risk to take, you know, a $2,500 fine, having to go to all these things, your insurance being uh, raised forever, mm -hmm. uh, losing your job, all the other <laughs> risks that, that you you take when you DUI, people will say, man, a hundred bucks, that's a lot. Hmm. I'm gonna risk going home. Whereas right. 20 bucks? Wait, mm -hmm. that was like one and a half drinks I had. I'll spend the 20. Yeah. Oh, and let me find two or three people to get in the taxi with, or get in the Uber or Lyft with. Me. Yeah, and it eliminates so many of the steps that you'd have to take. Mm -hmm. With Whereas if you call a taxi, they have to call you back. They might not have a car out. Mm. With the Uber, you literally can see estimated time. You can have your home address programmed into mm. it. So literally, as you're drunkenly at the bar, you can squint one eye and just click home. And you, you do that so well. I think you might have played, you might have played that <laughs> character not my on first TV. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a uh, little poll. Uh, ridiculous for, uh, well, Seattle has actually taken the place of San Francisco as being the most ludicrously uh, over-governed city in the country, and I'm thankful that somebody is taking on the, the lead stupid city role, taking it away from San Francisco. I'm very grateful. Do you agree that, uh, that the city council is, uh, is not right in this, and, and the case has a lot of merit, and we hope it'll be thrown out? And, then, and uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Pacific Legal Foundation, the organization only takes cases that will set a precedent that will help people in many other areas. So this forced unionization for this general welfare, uh, once that gets knocked down, then at least when other people try to do that in the future, they'll prevent it, be prevented from doing it. So next case, uh, we're talking about personal liberties, one of the three Ps for uh, Pacific Legal. Next. People for the Ethical Treatment of Property, so PETPO, yeah. versus U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are property rights uh, point of focus right. in the organization. Tell us a little bit about that. So this is a fun case. Like you said, this is a property rights case. So basically, uh, one of the ways that was described to me by my constitutional law professor in law school is that Congress has tools in their constitutional tool bag. And depending upon what they want to do, they will use one of those tools to pass legislation. One mm -hmm. of the main tools they've used to expand government in the last 75 years has been the Interstate Commerce Clause. Mm. And you've had a couple of cases in the past decade, I think, where you've actually had the court push back a little bit. But before that, you had about 70 years of unchecked, unlimited legislation. And I think that this is one of those instances mm -hmm. where you've had the EPA empowered to designate this is a Utah prairie dog as mm -hmm. an endangered species mm -hmm. and regulate it and protect it from takings, which is any disruption of its habitat, mm -hmm. and be justified, empowered through the Interstate Commerce mm -hmm. Clause. There's a, a few problems with that. Because what, a lot of those prairie dogs drive and they cross the border, <laughs> or how well, can it be well, interstate commerce? You might Explain it, that it, to it, me. It might be at the, just the, edge of being justified if it was possible that this was uh, some kind of commercial animal where maybe they were harvesting this animal or, or mm -hmm. selling it in interstate commerce 
This animal is not in commerce and it's only contained within Utah. It does not cross the border so of Utah. So intrastate. Right, intrastate. Yeah. And I think the first case, correct me if I'm wrong, was the FDR era and they had... Uh, All the worst had, constitutional violations came from the FDR. Yeah. <laughs> That's they the had foundation. The foundation of the destruction <laughs> of the Constitution, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his gang. Um, and it was a case about a farmer, if I believe correctly, the original case, who was growing excess feed to feed his cattle. Uh, um, is that correct? Wickard v. Filburn. Okay, that was uh, probably the first mm -hmm. really crazy use of the Interstate Commerce Clause. Well, the whole point of the Interstate Commerce Clause at the, at, you know, that, that inconvenient era, the actual founding, the reason mm -hmm. they founded that had this clause included in the Constitution was to ensure that states would not put up barriers to interstate mm. commerce. So you can't have Illinois pass protectionist policies to try to protect in-state interests from their neighboring mm. states. Mm. That's the entire purpose. And what you slowly see is as time goes on, it becomes about channels of interstate commerce mm. and avenues and mechanisms of interstate commerce. Mm. So with the Wicker case, you have it go all the way off the rails, so to speak, mm. and now Congress reserves the right to regulate interstate oh. commerce that has a substantial oh. impact or, or industries that have a substantial impact upon interstate commerce. Basically, this is... What industry do prairie dogs do? I mean, the industry of creating <laughs> holes that horses break their legs uh, in? Of being, uh, being adorable. <laughs> being adorable. Well, actually, they are... They General are, welfare. In many places, they, they fulfill the, the, uh, their targets for mm -hmm. people with varmint rifles. So I think you could call it target shooting <laughs> in industry, but that's a reach. So um, what... Uh, Pacific Legal Foundation is saying what that this not we can't just go into court and say this is stupid, Your Honor. No. I mean, what are we saying? <clears throat> that this this far exceeds um, even the widest breadth of how the Interstate Commerce Clause has been interpreted. Mm -hmm. And we won. We actually won at the district court level, mm -hmm. and it was a, a very big deal. This is like I said, there have only been I think two or three previous cases in the last decade mm -hmm. that the court has actually stepped in and said, Congress, you do not have the power to do this. The mm. Constitution does mm. not empower you to do this. Mm. And so we wanted through to its, Through its stooge, the EPA. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, that the case was appealed to the Tenth Circuit. Mm. Uh, we lost the Tenth Circuit, and now the case is hopefully going to be heard. I think it's the um, petition has been filed. I'm not sure if uh, certio rari, which is the court actually Except going to hear the case. Yeah. I'm not sure if yeah. that's gone through. The Civic Legal yet. Foundation has an awful lot of cases pending before the Supreme Court now. Hopefully we'll hear a couple of yes <laughs> votes on uh, Monday, no, Monday, Tuesday. The Maybe Tuesday, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, what do you think about this, Taylor? You think uh, that uh, somehow prairie dogs in Utah can be uh, connected loosely or even tenuously or in a fantasy or directly with interstate commerce? What's your, what's your feeling about that? It, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me, and I mean, I, I think I need, I would need, I, I read that there's an example of pe them not being able to refill the holes on their properties hmm. either. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm actually just like not really that familiar with oh. this. So. Well, the, I mean, the, the, li the line that the court has drawn where it's become so absurd mm. to uphold these laws, I think one of the cases was, I might mess up the name, but I think it was Morrison, and Morrison was a, a gun restriction where mm. they had said around schools. Mm. And, they had, and the argument that Congress had made was, if you allow guns uh, to be near schools, that could disrupt people's education, and if you disrupt people's education, they won't be able to get a job, and that will substantially oh. impact interstate commerce. Mm. Well, the court didn't buy it, mm. right? And, and so I think... Well, I think the California Teachers Association is much better at disrupting the education <laughs> than a few guns, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> folks <laughs> all right so um, pretty silly pretty silly uh, waste of taxpayers dollars the enforcement and and talk a little bit about if you would Tim the impact it's had on communities where there's a lot of these people can't even really landscape their lawns they can't right. build houses they can't improve roads there's the these holes actually create a danger. Is mm -hmm. this not right? Yeah, and I, I think that that goes back to my point when it comes to the interpretation of ambiguous language. So mm -hmm. the, the word that they invoke is a taking, right? Mm -hmm. And in the traditional sense, the taking of a species has been meant 
to uh, you know poach or something, or you're mm. out there hunting, mm -hmm. you're taking, run right? them over with your or tank, taking a property, like right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so this becomes, in regards to a protected species, you cannot do anything, even if it's your land, that may impact the environment of, mm. of the prairie dog. Mm. So if you want to lay some pipe down to water your lawn, you cannot do that if it mm. interferes with their habitat. Mm. And so um, it's just this. <laughs> disgusting display of a government overreach, but I'm hoping that, as you mentioned, the high court will agree I'm to hear the case. I'm hoping. And then the last case, and then we'll get on with stuff that's fun. No. Um, <laughs> I love Senator, this stuff. What do you <laughs> Senator, well, you're a lawyer. Of course you love this stuff. The rest of us, we read about, we read about this stuff and we have insomnia. No, we don't. Um, Center for Biological Diversity, CBD, folks, if you're not familiar with that organization, and it's a, a gross attack on the Constitution of the United States and its ability to siphon money through sue and settle. Uh, talk about some pretty sneaky folks. Um, check out CBD. But it's uh, Center for Biological Diversity versus Zinke. And this is the third P in the um, three-legged stool that supports the Constitution. <laughs> And that is procedural guarantees. Yes. So what you had was a situation where um, President Obama, in the outgoing um, period before he left office, had. Should we all just pray a prayer of thanks? <laughs> right? No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, they almost passed an amendment to uh, give him a third term. I thought that was on the table, but we'll save it for another <laughs> show. Um, basically, passed one of these midnight rules where he had designated um, certain species of I think it was bear and wolf to be off limits in terms of hunting. Mm -hmm. What that winds up doing is. Um, renders entire stretches of the Alaskan preservation, I'm not sure what the, the word is, off limits, basically no. to, to be developed or, or whatnot. Um, there is a statute that was passed in the mid-90s, it was 1996 actually, our director, our DC director, Todd Gaziano was involved when he was mm. at Heritage Foundation, mm. called the Congressional Review Act. And the purpose of the Congressional Review Act is basically any rules, that which is what administrative agencies pass, mm are supposed to go through, after the Congressional Review Act was uh, enacted, through a review process mm. whereby any new rules are submitted to Congress. Congress has a certain period whereby they can review those new rules, and if they so desire, they are the lawmaking branch, they can pass a bill to be signed by the President to not allow that rule to go forward. Mm. So basically, this statute had not been used, I think it was used once, since mm. 1996. Mm. Since President Trump has take, uh, taken office, you've had the Congressional Republicans use it, I believe, 15 times as a tool in their tool bag to actually pull a little bit of power back from the administrative mm. state and actually reserve that for the lawmaking branch. Mm. Well, so you had uh, your favorite organization here that did not like that when they applied the uh, CRA to President Obama's uh, last minute rule. Oh, this is the funny part, folks. <laughs> Listen to this. Tim's gonna tell you uh, the, the, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity's understanding of how U.S. government works is rather interesting and entertaining. Go ahead, Tom. So they sue and they claim that the Congressional Review Act is unconstitutional based on two things. Number one, that it actually infringes upon presidential power because administrative agencies are part of the executive branch. Mm. And so any rule like the CRA that would siphon power away from the administrative agencies is infringing upon presidential power. Uh, you know, ignore the fact that it's the president's party that is doing, is repealing these rules mm. with the president's mm. sanction in many cases, but we'll skip over that. Mm. Uh, the second point being that Congress has overstepped their bounds by doing this because once there's a delegation of power from Congress to the executive branch to administer these laws through these agencies, the agencies have sole discretion then to interpret, and there's a few cases that we could get into why they have the right to do this, but basically they are in charge of deciding, and, and keep in mind, these are unelected bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. They are not subject to uh, the electoral check that mm -hmm. James Madison is so or fond of. Or nor reality, if you <laughs> look at a lot of what they do, but go ahead. <laughs> so basically, you've got an organization like you mentioned um, that's very kind of out there, that is suing on constitutional grounds a law that is designed to restore the balance of power between the branches of government. Mm. So it's a very unique uh, and interesting case. I think we are still pending in the district court level. Mm. Mm. Uh, that case hasn't actually been heard yet. So this is all part of, um, actually, I'm not going to explain what it's part of because we want to get to the two other, we're running out of time, <laughs> folks. Time flies when you're babbling like an idiot. No, when we're having fun here. Um, California is considering a constitutional ban on internal combustion cars. Um, and I don't, we didn't assign this. Oh, maybe I'm gonna talk about this. Well, 
Um, I could go on for about an hour and a half about how stupid this is. So uh, I guess the idea is that California somehow believes that um, by creating a government regulation that is so onerous as to completely change the market for primary transportation that most people do and force people not to use a vehicle that has uh, been competitively improved over 100 years to be a marvel of engineering uh, and, and have a life expectancy of uh, a trip to the moon. A typical car now will last that long. They're going to say that you have to use, uh, what, wind-powered cars, uh, electrical cars, uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars, uh, any other kinds that you can think of? That, uh, now, John, does this strike you as a bit of a virtue signaling? Or, I mean, is this even feasible? I mean, the, the numbers I looked at, I said, we're hoping to have something moving on this within the next 25 to 50 years. Mm. I mean, is this Governor Brown or uh, the powers that be just kind of stepping in and, and telling the uh, Democratic voters what they want to hear? Well, I, I think it's absolutely that. And I, th I think the other side of it is that it's uh, the assumption that California can somehow um, somehow change global warming in its entirety by the activities of uh, 33 million people. Hmm. And, and the last time I looked, because I've, I've flown across the state borders, we do not have a wall that rises up from the <laughs> earth to the <laughs> top of the atmosphere that keeps... California air from <laughs> circulating through the ocean and into Nevada and back and all the rest of that. So what, what you're doing is you've taken something to a level of absurdity. And um, I think it really is just uh, uh, Governor Moonbeam, as we call him, his first go around, pandering to um, the, the wide-eyed idealists who have no idea about the power of the market or if it, it's a wonderful, beautiful simplicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, the chances of internal combustion cars disappearing by them uh, without the advent of some brilliant new technology that undoubtedly evil capitalists will come up in, <laughs> with in their <laughs> laboratories, not going to happen. So um, on that note, we're going to do a little wrap up, kind of a long uh, wrap up here. I want to thank um, Tim Snowball, who is your official title. You're not yet an attorney. What do you call yourself? What's your... Is it uh, legal fellow? Glor is glor glorified intern, I think. Glor no, glorified. Uh, <laughs> le le legal fellow, I believe. Legal fellow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very, very much for for uh, what you've given to the show, and Taylor Moritz. And I always want to. Is it Moritz or Moritz? Moritz. Moritz. See, I always, <laughs> I always want to think about Saint Moritz when I talk to her. My name is John Cameron. Thank you very much for watching the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you this evening. Look forward to you watching us in the future and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>